So we will now hear a presentation by Ra Reshma Roshania from Emory University. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'll be presenting some work from my dissertation research with Emory University, um, which we conducted in very close partnership with Care India. And it's on food environments and nutrition status, um, child nutrition status among circular migrants working in the brick kilns of Bihar. So um, this is likely a familiar sight to you if you have traveled by road um, through the Gangetic Plains of India. This is a brick kiln in Patna district of Bihar. Um, many kilns in India still use traditional processes for manufacturing bricks, so mainly relying on manual labor, and um, much of that is migrant labor. So as you can see here, there are homes constructed um, on the kiln where residents live throughout the season, um, and the season operates during the dry months, so from Bihar, this tends to be October to June. And then during the rains, um, the migrants return back home. So this type of repeated short-term movement with a return to the home residence is referred to as circular migration. Um, national level statistics grossly underestimate the number of circular migrants in India, but migration experts would put this number at around 100 million people who engage in temporary short-term migration in the country. So there are two main types of characterized circular migration. There is um, that which can result in the accumulation of wealth, but there's also circular migration which is undertaken by the lesser educated and lesser skilled, um, which is mainly for survival um, or coping migration. So coping migration tends to involve shorter distances, is often rural to rural, and um, work tends to be in low paid manual jobs such as agriculture or the construction industry um, of which brick kilns are a part of. Um, the work is often informal and so often done through labor contractors as a result of which there um, can be a great deal of exploitation with respect to working conditions and pay. But very importantly, these jobs also tend to involve migration of the entire family. Um, and so why would this be important? Why would we care about this? Children who engage in circular migration may be at a greater risk of undernutrition due to isolation from essential health services such as immunization, um, potential changes in caregiver time allocation, lack of access to sanitation, and um, the focus of this, this research, which is shifts in um, aspects of the food environment. And so we've paid particular attention to uh, differences by state of origin, as well as um, the child age at first migration, the hypothesis there being that perhaps children who first migrate at a younger, more vulnerable age have a higher risk of undernutrition compared to those who first migrate at an older age. So a bit about our methods. Um, this was a mixed method study for the quantitative component. We collected two rounds of cross-sectional data. I'll be presenting the second round to you today. Um, and we surveyed circular migrant mothers working in brick kilns who migrated with at least one child under three years of age. We employed a stratified cluster sampling design, so with 18 kilns, which were our clusters, randomly selected per each of the 38 districts or strata. Um, per kiln, we randomly selected three children under three years of age and our final sample size was 1,470 children under three. We digitally collected household survey data um, and child anthropometric data. Um, primary outcomes included nutrition status um, as measured by stunting and wasting, and secondarily, we looked at um, food security as measured by FAO's Food and Security Experiences Scale. And for the qualitative component, this really looked at sort of exploring um, perceived changes in food environment by migrants between their home and destination. And so we purposefully chose three districts kind of based on the geographic location. Um, and we employed in-depth interviews focused with, with migrant parents, um, focus group discussions with migrant women, and then key informant interviews with um, brick kiln owners and um, labor contractors. So getting on to our results, Seeing, uh, looking at the distribution of state of origin, we see that about half of migrants are within state or intrastate migrants, um, and the remaining half are from neighboring states. And then among children who are currently 24 to 35 months of age, we can see that there is a higher proportion of children who first migrate, who were either born during migration or first migrate during that first year of life. And um, that proportion is highest among the intrastate migrants. So that's that graph right there. So it's important to note that circular migrants um, do participate in agriculture or often participate in agriculture at home. So in our sample, we see that close to 50% report um, agriculture and agricultural labor as the primary occupation on average. Um, and food production at the home village is also uh, notable, especially for grains. 
And um, agriculture also serves as both a driver um, and an outcome of circular migration, migration as we found in our uh, qualitative work. So both men and women reported um, or indicated that the lack of irrigation infrastructure was a, a main driver of migration. So um, from one quote, in our land there's no water. If we had water, then this many people would not come to the chimney from Ranchi. We have a world full of land. Um, in terms of agricultural outcomes, um, m many migrants spoke of using earnings from the season for agricultural inputs, but um, this was seemingly more um, inputs kind of just to get through the next rainy season rather than longer term, larger investments. So um, we take our earnings and use them towards our field, then after six months in the season we can go anywhere and work. So we just spoke of an important non-market source of food, which is own production. Another important non-market source of food is the public distribution system, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about throughout the course of the week. Um, but it provides highly, it's a Government of India initiative, which provides highly subsidized grain to below poverty line households. So average utilization at home that we saw was around 50% um, with West Bengal being um, above 80%. And so this number essentially drops to zero uh, during migration because um, currently PDS benefits are tied to the locality and are not portable. So essentially what we're seeing is for a large proportion of migrants, their sources of food at home um, go from being own production, PDS, um, and the private market to essentially being reduced to just to the private market during um, migration. And PDS is important to look at because in our sample we do see um, significant differences in reported food insecurity by PDS utilization. So those migrants who report using PDS um, at home are less likely to report food insecurity compared to those who don't. Exploring food insecurity a bit further, um, as expected, we do see differences in um, food insecurity by wealth quintiles, so higher wealth quintiles reporting less food insecurity, um, as well as household size on the kiln, so larger household sizes are more likely to report food insecurity. But very interestingly, we see that um, there is a difference um, in the number of years a household reports migrating for work and um, by food security. So those households who have reported migrating for um, a greater number of years are more likely to report food insecurity compared to those who, who have migrated for less years. Um, and again, this is cross, keeping in mind this is cross-sectional data. Um, exploring the prices dimension of the food environment, many migrants express that food prices in the destination are higher at the kiln compared to at home. However, interestingly, perceived affordability is also higher during migration. And this is likely because there is a system of weekly pay allowances that are given to migrant families during the season. Those allowances are then deducted from a family's earnings as, um, at the end. Um, but at home, compared to at home where there really isn't that regular source of income. So both of these quotes actually come from the same participant and she says, here it is so expensive, what can I say? And then later on, if we work or don't work, even if we only work for two days in a week, we'll still get 300 or 400 rupees, so we eat whatever we want. Um, accessibility also emerged as an important dimension for circular migrants, so proximity to markets is one of the determining factors of whether or not migrants liked a particular kiln and therefore would consider returning in the following year. So these quotes come from different partic participants, obviously. Here the market is good, it is in the village, there are close to 10 stores for vegetables, versus this kiln is the worst, the bazaar hot, everything is far, and the bricks are heavier too. Um, our primary outcome was nutrition status, so at the top here we see stunting. As expected, we can see that um, older children have a higher prevalence of stunting, notably over 70% of children 24 to 35 months are, moder are, are stunted. Um, and then for wasting, uh, down at the bottom, again as expected, we see a jump in uh, wasting prevalence at around six months of age, likely when complementary foods are beginning to be introduced. Results from the multivariable model show that there are differences in the odds of child stunting by the state of origin, um, adjusting for wealth, child age, and all of the variables listed here. So specifically, interstate migrants have a lower odds of stunting compared to intrastate migrants. Um, and also, we see that compared to children who first migrated at 24 to 35 months, children who migrated at a younger age have a higher odds of stunting. So in summary, circular migration is an increasingly important livelihood strategy, often in addition to agriculture. Um, food affordability increases during migration, but this doesn't seem to lead to long-term food security. I think this is an area um, that warrants further inquiry. There are many next steps of this, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, and children who first migrate at a younger age are at a higher risk of stunting. Implications of this study include, um, so you know, there are many data gaps in national level statistics around short-term migration, especially female and child migration, and hopefully this, is, uh, this can help 
uh, contribute to filling some of those data gaps. Secondly, India does recognize the right to food, um, and there are many programs that help realize this right to food. However, as we see, this, this right um, doesn't necessarily apply for circular migrants, and there are ongoing policy efforts, long-standing policy efforts, to make PDS benefits portable. Um, hopefully, the study can contribute to some of those policy-level discussions. And lastly, the study can assist in targeted programming to improve access to health and nutrition services among circular migrant children who are a particularly vulnerable group. I thank you.